at home with Jim and Joy, and I always say it, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart, that you are an important part of our EWTN family, and we would love to hear from you. All you need to do is give us a jingle during this live broadcast at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling and you're outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email, Jim and Joy at EWTN. Dot com. Well, today we bring to you a beautiful, delightful woman, mother of eight children, one with autism and epilepsy. Her name is Anne Bradley Leopold. She is the founder and the CEO of Emmaus Home. They have a beautiful website called EmmausHome.org, and she's going to be sharing with us her life story, what God did in the midst of her life in birthing this beautiful ministry yes. and um, yeah. the great encouragement she is to the people in the Philadelphia area. She makes you so proud to be Catholic, to be Christian, as she lifts up the sacredness and dignity of every human being, especially those with intellectual disabilities, her own child, and this beautiful home that she has for men and women in this way. And Joy, just thinking about, uh, we've grown so much doing this show, and especially interviewing people with disabilities and those that are working with them, not to romanticize the difficulties of people with disabilities and those working with them, um, but just the mystery of Christ united with them and just what they offer us in terms of seeing Christ. I'm thinking uh, in particular of, of, a, of a man who attends our parish, our cathedral, and this, this man has Down syndrome beautiful guy. He's such an inspiration to me and so many. His, his way, his worship, his piety, his service, because mm -hmm. he, he works with every bulletin that we have. He folds all the bulletins. Folds and puts inserts mm -hmm. in them. So all the bulletins have been touched by, let's say his name's Mark. Mm -hmm. um, but when he walks into the cathedral and you know we're sitting in the pews, he might come in a little bit late, and then he goes up before the altar and the tabernacle and the crucifix, and like we all do, you know, we, we bow our heads in reverence to the Lord, but you know, he'll bow, he'll stay down, he may bow, bow twice, mm -hmm. and, or he, he genuflects, does a couple of things, but, but not to be seen. I mean, he's just, it's sincere. He's Pure and when he turns and around and he look, and every, I'm just kind of like, that is so beautiful. And then he, comes, he might shake your hand, sits down. And the other night he was at a meeting, an association that we have. It was the Knights of Columbus, and we're instituting, you know, new the people, new officers. officers in different positions. So there's like 15 different positions, and, and this this guy's installing everybody. And Mike, Mark, Mike, he's a, he's a knight, but he wasn't in any particular position. But the guy installing people, you know, had a book, and he was reading all these prayers, and you know what the job roles are, and um, he so comes up. Need. He comes up, this guy, and he says, "I hold the book." Right. I want to hold the book. And so all night he's holding the book for the guy to read and all these other guys are getting installed. He's not getting installed to any position, but he's so happy mm -hmm. for everybody. He's holding the book. He's a part of and it. And you know, it's like, why didn't I get up to hold the book? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a little embarrassed or maybe it's beneath me, you know. What? I'll hold the book. Mm -hmm. And I was looking at him, you know, and during the night and he just looked at me and he said something like, you're looking at me. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm loving you. You inspire me. And he goes, I know, mm -hmm. I know. And it's just no air of mm -hmm. that self. And th anyway, I don't want to over romanticize, but I'm saying Christ is so present in this man and with this man, and he inspires me. And we need to be able to see that. God wants us to see that in people with disabilities and the great gifts they are, not only serving them, but the gifts, the gifts they are to us. Well, and the, one of the beautiful things that he does all the time, you know, like you can go to church and you're worried about all your problems and all your stuff. He is so loving and so gracious and he's never about himself he doesn't know how to be about himself and he comes in and he'll just hug you and you know what sometimes you just need that hug and it's just like how are you and he's always about the other yeah. you know and sometimes we all get so caught up with ourselves and how we are and what what's happening in my life and what god isn't doing or is doing He's, he's straight and steady the course, he loving is. God and honoring Him. So we're going to hear more gracious. about Emmaus Home with a whole group home for men and women with uh, intellectual disabilities, the great work that's going on there. Also a, a, a day service they have for people not in the home, but for other people that get involved, habilitation services and, and so on. It's going to be great. It will be wonderful. 
You have something well, special we tonight. We do. Now, yeah. we're going to, you know, every now and then, we're going to start a new thing. We're going to uh, be bringing some segments to you from Donna Marie Cooper O'Boyle. So, we're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to hear from Donna Marie Cooper O'Boyle, and she's written a book entitled Feeding Your Family Soul. And she's going to give us a tip on how to pass on these faith lessons to our children at the dinner table. First of all, we need to make sure we're having dinner at the table yeah. as a family. Yeah. We need to bring that back to our culture. And, and Donna has done a great job with just saying, let's not complicate this. Let's keep this simple and let's be a family. Let's come together at a meal and enter in. You're making that. me hungry. Oh, you're, yeah. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back and you'll hear from Donna Marie. Please don't go away. Hello, welcome to Feeding Your Family Soul. What's on the menu? We are loved and we are valuable. It's not always easy to believe in our value when the world is overflowing with confusing messages. St. John Paul II wrote in Love and Responsibility, a woman is capable of truly making a gift of herself only if she fully believes in the value of her person and in the value as a person of the man to whom she gave herself. We need to listen to God and not our lopsided and convoluted culture. We need to value ourselves, our spouse, and our family in the light of God's beautiful love. So here's some food for thought. One time, a woman at an airport shared a special story with me about how her little girl, who went running ahead of her and suddenly gave a complete stranger a warm hug. The stranger was a dirty, homeless man sitting on the sidewalk. When the woman caught up to them, the man looked up at her and said, your daughter did not just make my day, she made my life. How about this recipe for your family? Make a gift of yourselves to one another in the family and beyond. Sometime soon, discuss together at the dinner table what you can do to help others who, because of life's difficult circumstances, might not feel valued or loved. Your acknowledgement to them in the form of kind words or actions and Christ's love through you to them can truly transform their life. In addition, you'll be teaching the children to not only value the sanctity of human life, but also about the importance of helping others in practicing the works of mercy. By the way, eating together at the dinner table is a wonderful way to show the family that you love them and that you are important and so are they. A parent and grandparent's love is powerful and reminds the children that God loves them. It also boosts their self-worth. So let us never tire of praying for families scattered all around our world, whether they're living in huts or palaces. Every family needs our prayers. Show your family you love them. Eat dinner together. Bye for now. God bless you. Well, thank you, Donna. Well, we want to welcome you back and remember that you're an important part of our EWTN family. So if you have a question for our guest today, Ann Bradley Leopold, just give us a jingle during the live broadcast at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling us outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271. 2980 and you can always send us an email Jim and Joy at EWTN.com and hopefully we'll use your question or your comment right here on the air. Well now I'd like to bring to you this very beautiful woman. Her name is Ann Bradley Leopold and she is the founder and the CEO of Emmaus Home. You could go to her website EmmausHome.org. Well Ann welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Thank you Joy and Jim. Well, it's, it is our pleasure and it is a delight to meet you and to hear, as we've researched you, the things that God has done in your life. 
but I want you to tell our family at home a little bit about Anne Bradley Leopold, who you are, where you've come from, and what you bring to us today. Well, I'm a mother of eight, six sons and two daughters, and, um, and really I had no uh, more ambitions than to do just that, to just be a mom and, and stay at home. And as a young mother, um, with babies up crying um, through the night with ear infections and colic, uh, I would tune into 36 back home in Philadelphia, which is EWTN. And that's when I kind of fell in love with uh, the network mm -hmm. and with Mother Angelica yeah. and Father Benedict and all the early uh, people. And it just helped me um, really learn the faith. Mm -hmm. I had been raised Catholic, cradle Catholic, 16 years of Catholic school. But when I really heard her speak, spoke to my heart, and I was like a sponge. Um, so then I got involved in a mother's rosary group pretty early on in my marriage, and um, that grounded me. It grounded me through the years. We met and prayed every week um, for 10 years, um, and they were wonderful, faith-filled women um, that were going through the same struggles as me, and somebody was always pregnant. Um, you know, it was like a competition, you know, mm -hmm. and it was, it was just amazing. Um, environment to raise a family and yeah. to have their beautiful witness. Um, so then when my fourth son, Kevin, was born, we were visiting Florida actually at the time, and he was a year old. We had thought up to that point he was a normal, healthy baby, um, and then he wound up having 12 grand mal seizures and was in all children's and clear water for a week. Um, they thought he had a brain tumor, and I remember very clearly um, um, saying to the Lord, you know, Lord, I, I'm not ready to give him back. Um, please let me keep him, and I'll keep him whatever way you want. I was making, wheeling and dealing with mm -hmm. the Lord uh, always. And um, um, he did let me keep him, and, um, and I tried to love him and, and accept him exactly the way he is with all. So now, fast forward, he's 26 now, and he has um, pretty profound autism, uh, intellectual disability, and um, epilepsy, which never went away. Mm -hmm. So, How old is he now? He's now 26. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, he's um, right now um, living somewhat independently in Emmaus home, which is the home that I founded two years ago. Um, but life with Kevin um, has had its uh, share of sorrows, struggles, but also great, great joys in the little things that he does, just um, living in the moment, living in the present. Mm -hmm. So he, his life has taught me so um, so many, so many truths yeah. of um, the Christian life and um, getting to heaven. Yeah. So how, this has just been the last couple of years, yeah. the Lord gave you a vision for Emmaus Home. Yeah. What, what transpired to make that take place? What moved you to do that? Um, did you have the abilities to do something like that? The organizational skills, the money, the what? And, and why after all these years, you know, <laughs> now? Well, know. I found, um, I read about um, L'Arche Community, uh, which is French for the Ark. Um, it's an international movement founded by Jean Beignet, yeah. a Canadian, and it really touched my heart. I just really loved what I read. Um, I loved his stories. I loved um, uh, Father Henri Nouwen, also uh, lived in a, a daybreak community up in Canada with a profoundly handicapped young man named Adam. So that really touched me. Mm -hmm. And I got on the phone and um, I was just so um, bullish. I, you know, who do I think I was calling and, and, and assuming I could start something like this? And so they kind of put me in my place in a nice gentle way and said, said you need 10 years to form a L'Arche. Mm -hmm. You need a board. Um, you need to become a nonprofit in your state. You need about $100,000. Well, that was the end of that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, Lord, I guess that's not in the you know, cards right now for Kevin. So then uh, I was going monthly for spiritual direction up to um, a very good Franciscan priest, one of the CFRs in the South Bronx. And I was sharing with him you know, the whole journey with Kevin and how I wasn't happy with the secular agencies that I saw out mm -hmm. there the model of kind of like um, the walking dead, mm -hmm. um, large turnover staffing. Yes. And um, I'll never forget one time I had my son in um, challenge uh, Little League when he was little. And I mean, I used to take him, he hated it. He used to throw his baseball hat out the window the whole way, you know, every time yeah. we were leaving. But I wanted to expose him to everything that all my other kids had been mm -hmm. exposed to. I remember sitting there in the bleachers watching a young, severely uh, autistic girl um, with her staff who was off to the side laughing and 
smoking, and, and there she was eating um, sticks and mulch. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a condition called pica, mm -hmm. which is uh, sometimes prevalent with people with autism. And I just, that just like spoke volumes to me. You know, I thought, oh my gosh, like there they are, there she is, she could choke, and they don't even care. No one was stopping, no one was no, intervening. No, I intervened, and yeah. I thought, and that really profoundly affected me, and I thought, I can't let my son be in this kind of place where nobody cares. Mm -hmm. And he can't, uh, he can't advocate for himself. He can hardly speak. Mm -hmm. So that really um, affected me. Um, and it just kind of was the impetus to, uh, that made me explore other options, including L'Arche. So then um, when I shared all this with my spiritual director, um, he encouraged me um, to go for it. You know, I said, I feel like the Lord is telling me to do this. I don't know why, I'm just a mother of eight, I stayed at home, I have a religion background, but no money, no connections, nothing. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, God Don't has, let that stop you. God has plenty of money. <laughs> right? That's what Mother Teresa always used mm -hmm. to say. You've got a mother's heart, mm -hmm. and that's what God will use, your heart, to create a loving, nurturing place uh, where the mother's heart is, um, is, is um, you know, uh, considered. Mm -hmm. and. Um, and the, ch and the sons and daughters of, of the mothers will be loved mm -hmm. the way only a mother can love. I mean, I don't take the place of the mothers who we serve, but I get it because of my experience with my own son. So you, you're, I'm trying to understand, you're looking for, I mean, you've raised your son and your children for multiple years, mm -hmm. but what, what is it that you're looking for that you can't do? I mean, what, you know, all the way, all of his life. What is it about a home like mm -hmm. this that you wanted for him? What, what is the benefit versus being with you? Well, um, because I got to the point where my life was Kevin. Um, when you have a, a child with disabilities, the disabilities sometimes take over, and those children become the center of your lives. And so it's hard. Um, it's, a, it's almost traumatizing on the other children. And then Kevin had epilepsy, has epilepsy, so watching the seizures, watching the meltdowns, the, the doctors, the hospitalizations, that's all takes a toll mm -hmm. on the family. And so my hope, my prayer was that my son would live with one of his seven siblings, but mm -hmm. I really came to realize that's not fair. Mm -hmm. That's not fair to Kevin, it's not fair to his siblings. Mm -hmm. And then I remember being on retreat, and it was off in like Newburgh, New York. Again, it was at a Franciscan retreat. And this very holy prophetic priest, who I didn't know, I just had met him, I was sharing with him about Kevin. And he says, well, you know why Kevin's always having meltdowns, don't you? You know why Kevin's always angry. He doesn't want to live with you anymore. He's 24 years old. Mm -hmm. Why would he want to live with mom? Wow. Does he a... <laughs> really want to? I mean, that really was the word, and mm -hmm. I was angry. My mm -hmm. pride went up. Wow. And I said, who, do you, who does he think he is? He doesn't even know us. And I encounter that a lot with the mothers. They can't let, let go. go. Mm -hmm. Their identity is almost tied in mm -hmm. all the years of advocating, all the years of fighting, mm -hmm. and it is a fight. Mm -hmm. um, you're fighting for your own family much of the time. So, you know, you almost don't have a life. You know, my life was, when am I going to trim my son's fingernails? You know, what day of the week? Mm -hmm. That was my life. Mm -hmm. And then I came to the point where I realized God the Father loves me inside and out, and he wants me to have a life. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. Right. It's okay for Kevin to be independent, as independent as he can be, and to not live with me, but to live in a home where the values that he's grown up with and the love is transferred mm -hmm. by live-in uh, house assistance. So before Amaya's home, before that happened, mm -hmm. did you put Kevin like in, in daycare? Did you participate in any of the other organizations programs. or programs that the government was offering? Yes, and again, you know, <clears throat> God's hands is on all of us, but especially, I think, on his little ones mm -hmm. with disabilities. Um, he's just such a faithful God. Um, I met a man, actually a Mennonite man, a very good man who was very influenced by Noen and, um, and Jean Vanier, and he broke away from a secular provider, a big provider agency in Pennsylvania, and started um, a holistic faith-based um, organization. Mm -hmm. And um, he wouldn't advertise in the newspaper, he only took word of mouth, college students, church referrals um, to, to work for him. And it was the most, I won't say the name, but it was just the name just resonated within me. Mm -hmm. It was such a beautiful name. And I thought I was at such a torn, um, a bad place, I think, with his behaviors and the seizures and feeling so overwhelmed that it was like a breath of fresh air to find this mm -hmm. man, to 
Kevin became one of his first clients. In fact, he would come and do the direct care work sometimes. Mm -hmm. Now he's retired, but he's grown the organization. It's, it has like six homes and three day programs. It's very well known in our part of Pennsylvania. Um, so yes, I did um, take advantage of um, you know what um, the secular world right. had to offer. My son was blessed in that he got a waiver, waiver funding very young mm -hmm. uh, to care for him and provide him with the supports that his challenging behavior, you know, mm -hmm. requires. So what was your original vision for Emmaus Home? How has it developed? What are the components of it? What was your hope? What's the reality of it? What's professional about it? What's spiritual about it? How many people do you have in it? Unpack it for us. Well, um, that same spiritual director I had in New York referred me to his friend in New Jersey um, who was doing the same thing, although she was light years ahead of me. Um, she had the same journey, similar journey to mine. Um, I hope she's listening. Um, she's a sister in Christ, and she's been a wonderful mentor and a supporter, her and her pastor. So I would go over there and visit. I would go back and forth, and I would take notes, and I would ask questions, and I would bug the heck, I think, about everybody. They were would cringe when they'd see me coming, I think. Um, so she gave me great momentum and great support. And every time I was feeling like, I can't do this, I can't do this, who do I think I am? This mm -hmm. is crazy, putting the cart before the horse. She would say, this is happening, it's happening, it's happening. And um, so what I did was um, I got on the Archdiocesan website, there was a lot of vacant buildings because of the merging parishes there. Yeah. And um, um, I found a, a property that had just closed as a parish down near the Philadelphia airport. And I approached the pastor and um, he was very open. He knew about um, Henry Now, and he had read Their Hearts Burn Within Them, a meditation on the Eucharist, and that really influenced me in naming Emmaus Home, Emmaus Home. Um, so he had a very open heart, and um, the bishop as well had to you know, agree. So we were able to um, use the rectory, the mm -hmm. convent, and the school for our purposes. Now, originally, I only wanted it to be basically a private home where they would just rent as boarders. Um, and not have the state come in and license it and, and require so much. But because of the severity of the people, that they're very needy and they need a lot of one-on-one -on -one supervision, uh, we had to become licensed. So um, we kind of did it all at once, which is very unusual. Mm -hmm. And if I had to do it again, I probably wouldn't have. Um, we started the home and then the day program because during the day, folks, need, they need mm -hmm. to have someplace meaningful to go. Um, the guys we have now and the one girl are not really employable. So um, we do go out in the community. We're a community-based program. So they're out and about and are integrated throughout um, you know, the community. Um, and we also serve people in their own homes that live still at home, and that's called habilitation, community hab. Um, so the challenge, um, in the beginning, I wanted it to be total ministry, just you know, serving God's little ones in the way we chose to do it. And now we are a full... Um, service provider in the state, in the DHS, the Department of Human Services in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So being very um, inexperienced with all of this, it's been a huge learning curve for all of us. And, and there's just a few of us um, on the team and we all, each of us wears many hats. Me, you know, having to learn what is a board, what is a fiduciary role, mm -hmm. um, trying to still get boards, trying to fundraise, try, trying to medical bill in the system, mm -hmm. it's just, yeah. A lot. <laughs> now you have a couple, is it a couple that lives in the home? Well, we have live-in house parents. House parents, okay. So um, mostly I advertise on catholicjobs.com, which is really nice because it's international. And every house parent except one, my son, has come to Emmaus Home via Catholic Jobs. Mm -hmm. And um, so they commit to the minimum of a year, and we encourage them to stay longer if they're able. Mm -hmm. So they live as a family with our brothers with disabilities. We have four men right now that live with us, right. including my son. And so it's a beautiful life. You know, they've developed wonderful relationships. Um, we've already had our first round go. Mm -hmm. um, the one house parent is now studying to be a priest in Poland. Mm -hmm. um, the other young man is discerning with the Trappist. So mm -hmm. we're seeing good fruit right. as well. Mm -hmm. And this whole journey, God just continues to bless us and show great, he gives us signs. Even though there's many, many valleys, 
you know, there's many, many peaks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and then being licensed in the state also comes with how qualified things have to be and the restrictions and all the legality of all yeah. of that. Yeah. And that's, that's a lot of hoops. And you're like, mm -hmm. no, I just want to love, yeah. right? I mean, that, yeah. was, that was where it came yeah. from. It came from your mother's yeah. heart. Yeah. But in the long run, mm -hmm. um, that will be fruitful too in the ministry. Yeah. Right? Yeah. What, in the, it's a home. Like you yes. said, it's a home. Yeah. It's not a house. I was saying house. It's, it's a home. Right. It's a home. What, what are the components in there? What are your hopes in terms of the abilities of these? It's all men? No, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. she, the woman comes to the day program. Okay. okay. Yeah. So the, the, these guys in here, what are you looking for about them? Uh, are you able to, to say, do they have some special abilities? What's the intellectual ability level? Um, what kind of communication skills do they have? You're thinking about recreational things for them, spirituality. Mm -hmm. what, what all goes into the home, their relationships, people coming in that might have expertise? Mm -hmm. Is this all a part of it, like what I'm saying? To bring yeah. them into a comprehensive, all the comp comprehensiveness they can experience as human beings, as human persons. Because a lot of times we could just say, well, these people have disabilities mm -hmm. and we just need to accept that, whatever that is. And sometimes it's a lot lower than, than mm -hmm. it really is. Yeah. And it's kind of like a pity thing. Yeah. Well, they need more than pity. We need to learn from them and we need to say, maybe there's some gifts and abilities here if we could recognize those or pull them out or get them with somebody. I would like to share uh, a little a story about one of our residents, his name is Martin. And Martin is 33, and he's profoundly disabled. He does not speak, uh, has cerebral palsy, microcephaly, um, and, and severe intellectual disabilities. And when Martin first, they approached me, the county. We mm -hmm. get a lot of referrals right. from the, uh, local counties, mm -hmm. and they asked me to consider him. So he came. He has severe dysphagia, which means he can't swallow, so he is at risk at choking. Sure. So, and he wore a helmet at the time because he had fallen and cracked his skull and he was on a gait belt because mm -hmm. he had a poor gait mm -hmm. and he almost looked like non-human mm -hmm. you know and, and I was really scared of him I thought oh no way because we're not skilled medical right. people mm -hmm. you know we get training that's required mm -hmm. by the state and all and I was so petrified by him and I thought, no, absolutely not. We are not, we're just new. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're watching us diligently. Mm -hmm. We could get sued and that's, that's gonna be the end of Emmaus right. home. And even though like the house parent who's now a seminarian said, why don't you really pray about it, Anna? I really think we could handle this. We can do this. We can, no, 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 no. So then a couple of weeks had gone by and I had this vision of Jesus, you know, the one knocking mm -hmm. at the door, knocking. Mm -hmm. And then I get a call from his caseworker, and she said, would you consider letting him live in the convent building on the campus where I had been living with my, some of my children? The other guys were in the rectory, and then the church was there, the school was there, then the convent building. Mm -hmm. And that's when it really hit home that the Lord really, really, really wanted Martin with us. Mm -hmm. So then I said to him, well, Lord, if, this, if you want him here, you better send somebody really special mm -hmm. to help him transition because this guy, he's in a bad way. He was in a bad way on so many levels. He was dying, really, he was languishing. He wouldn't make eye contact, he was angry. He was taking his helmet and throwing it at people. Mm -hmm. And it was all used against him. Um, he used to carry Mother Angelica's picture around. He, he just was in love with Mother Angelica <laughs> in, the, in the EWTN. And um, unfortunately, in the home where he was living, they were not letting him um, they weren't respecting his spirituality and his <coughs> desire to go to Mass and to watch UWTN. Mm -hmm. And we saw all that and we saw his religiosity and that he would carry around religious, he was like very sensory, yeah. mm -hmm. so he carries things around. He's a character, you'll see him later mm -hmm. in the video, mm -hmm. but he carries around little holy cards and little books. Mm -hmm. He loves Therese, you know. And I knew that there was something here and, yeah. and I couldn't discount it. So I agreed um, to let him come and he came in June of, or July of last year. And a few weeks later, I got a call from the Sisters of Life up in New York. They had a postulant who wasn't working out, and she, she needed to, she was leaving. She discerned not to be a postulant. She um, um, had a gift for the, um, working with the disabled, we were told. So could we give her a position? Mm -hmm. So she was the one the Lord had sent to help Martin mm -hmm. transition. Mm -hmm. She worked with him every day, one-on-one, -on -one, mm -hmm. and doing the same thing every day. And um, Martin received his first Holy Communion in November. Martin doesn't wear a helmet anymore. The gate belt's off. 
crazy. Martin is like a mystic. Mm -hmm. When yeah. you watch him at Mass, he goes crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, we really feel he is a mystic, mm -hmm. and he sees everything mm -hmm. for what it is. And let's just pause right at that beautiful point, speaking with Ed and Bradley Leopold, founder and CEO of Emmaus Home, EmmausHome.org. We want to hear from you. Don't go away. Welcome back. Well, remember that we want you to be a part of our show. So if you have a question for Anne, please don't hesitate to call during this live broadcast at 1-800-221-9460. If you're calling us and you're outside of North America, you can reach us at area code 205-271-2980. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com. And hopefully we'll use your question or your comment right here on the air. We're having a wonderful discussion with Anne Bradley Leopold, who is the founder and CEO of Emmaus Home. Go to the website, EmmausHome.org. Well, Anne, before we went to break, you were sharing the beautiful story about Martin. Mm -hmm. And um, so now Martin is watching EWTN. And he's going to church, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. And so, and that, I mean, that was your heart cry that you wanted other people to be loved and cared for in the way that you were taking care of Kevin, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And so to see that, uh, although you were cautious as to say, can I say yes to Martin? You know, and Jesus was saying, say yes to Martin. Yes. Share with us yeah. more in, in terms of what makes Emmaus Home unique, that spiritual component. You said you selected Emmaus our hearts burned within within us, mm -hmm. you know, as we were with him. Um, so there must be a deep spirituality that you have. Could you share just some of the components of that spirituality? I know you mentioned the Sacred Heart, the Immaculate Heart. Yeah. You mentioned Mother Teresa, Vanier. So these are, how does that work its way out? What is that spirituality? Well, um, weekly we were having community mass, so our pastor would come and celebrate the Mass, and then we'd have fellowship, like a potluck afterwards. So the guys really got to know a lot of the people from the parish on a, who they knew by name, so it was really a nice thing. Um, now, unfortunately, because the parish campus was sold, you know, that's come to an end. Um, so now we're changing and shifting again. Um, also, um, the seminarian who went to Poland um, did what's called a Jesus run. And he brought it down from the Friars of the Renewal. That's one of their ministries. Mm -hmm. And they would basically um, make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and go out into Center City, Philadelphia, and serve um, the homeless mm -hmm. and spend time with them and pray with them and listen to them. And that's something that a couple of our residents got to partake in. So that was really beautiful so that they feel like they're giving. Right. And um, they're not always the recipients. Mm -hmm. um, right. We have Taze Prayer. So one of the guys who works for us, um, has led this, and it's every Tuesday in the house where we, we pray and we sing, we read the gospel, and that's a beautiful, beautiful time. Um, and sometimes we'll get a priest to come and celebrate Mass for us when we had the Blessed Sacrament in our church, and mm -hmm. that was another great miracle. It's mm -hmm. been a story of miracles that we as uh, lay people were given such privilege and honor to have our Lord with us for the whole two years mm -hmm. in our church. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I tell you, right before I joined, I came, you know, we work mm -hmm. in a pregnancy medical center with girls in crisis pregnancy. And then we do this show, then we go back and do that work. And uh, we've been blessed to have um, a tabernacle, the real presence mm -hmm. of Jesus mm -hmm. in the tabernacle. And we can even open the tabernacle, and our Lord is there in a monstrance. And mm -hmm. our, so we always try to spend time there. It was a busy morning with some problems with technology at the center. But I thought before I go and do this show with you and, and speaking about the mystery of Christ in these people with disabilities, the mystery of Christ in the least, let me open the tabernacle mm -hmm. and get on my knee or knees and, and look at the Lord. And there's such a, a link between people with disabilities and the Eucharist. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, the Lord is just so, I mean, there he is in that, that house, so small, you mm -hmm. could do anything with him, and just there, and somehow there's, I, I wanted to see him before mm -hmm. I spoke with you. Mm -hmm. And so you're saying that same thing, the power of the Eucharist, the Lord's mm -hmm. presence. Mm -hmm. So I hope whatever you do or wherever you'll be, mm -hmm. that maybe you'll be graced with being near the tabernacle, near uh, a monstrance. And I'd be really interested to know what it's like for them to look at the Lord yes. in, in, in the host or just to have the host. That's why the Eucharist is so important. You have mass. I mean, the presence of the life of the Lord in the midst of the people like yeah. that. Yeah. His amen to that, his presence on the campus. Mm -hmm. We find it incredible. Mm -hmm. We didn't always have that, and it mm -hmm. makes a huge difference. Yeah. How important is the Eucharist to those of you who serve as well as to the community? Well, everything. You know, just being restored and renewed in his presence, you know, I know for me personally um, to spend time with the Lord in a holy hour is um, it's restorative mm -hmm. and because to do this work um, where you are mission based but then you're also in the bureaucracy thick, you know you've got to stay grounded and mm -hmm. you have to keep looking up otherwise you can't do this work right. and, and I think he continues to um, communicate that to me um, with especially now with all these changes and moves and we have to shift and and even with finding the right people mm -hmm. and the right house parents with right. the right heart you know it's all yeah. so you know yeah. you, you'll be yeah. so overwhelmed right. you, you, you right. can't do one it one single thing is overwhelming right right but mm -hmm. but i've been really trying to just give it over and just lay it down and say this is yours lord and mm -hmm. whatever you want and, and it yeah. removes me from the equation right. yeah. well i mean i <laughs> encountered that too and one of the things i encounter is what why am i doing this uh-huh and he says, for me. <laughs> but That's you, all. When you get still like that, where you see the Lord in the Eucharist, the same work we're doing. We saw a thousand girls last year, and 40% mm -hmm. and of them think we're an abortion clinic. We don't say we're an abortion clinic. Mm -hmm. We're called Heart Choice. And you're dealing with that, and some go on to have an abortion. It's kind of like, it's just so overwhelming. So you have to have that resurrection, Easter belief. But also, you hear the Lord say to you, I'm so for this, Anne. I'm so for this, Jim, or any pregnancy medical center, or people that work with people with special needs. Like, I'm really in this. I'm I came for these people. I'm attracted to them. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Mm -hmm. And that just helps you to, to get, you know, reconfigured and centered right. to say, yeah, really, this isn't about me. He's just really, let me land on you. Let my grace land on you. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll bring the people. I'll bring the funds. I'll bring whatever, because I love these people. Right. And this world mm -hmm. wants to reject them mm -hmm take care of them before they're even born to see the light of day and if they could have their way do something right. horrid after but we are a people of life and the lord is we're on his side right he's on our side in this mm -hmm. um and, and you're doing great work joy let's take this phone call chris welcome to at home with jim and joy your question or your comment for ann hi um hi ann um i too am a mother with a 26 year old autistic um, intellectually disabled uh, son who's at the point of needing residential and looking around there really aren't those resources nor um, I'm kind of cautious about uh, um, putting him in a place like that to begin with and I'm just wondering what what would you recommend to me and if I thought about doing something like this where would I start what would you what would you say I should I should do well definitely you know take it uh, to deep prayer and if you have a spiritual director um, you know you're close to uh, or you have you know definitely discern you know together um, um, yeah just pray and then um, um, you know if you know any other faith-based providers out there in your area or if there's a large community um, you know get get in touch with those people because I was very blessed in having the Mennonite gentlemen uh, share um, a lot of valuable resources with me as well as my friend in New Jersey um, so you really do need support uh, you know you should be making visits taking lots of notes and, and talking to a lot of people okay you mentioned something early in the show about a waiver or something and mm -hmm. I'm not sure what you're talking about with that mm -hmm. so people who have children or people with disabilities mm -hmm. what's this waiver you're talking about or getting in the system or funding or what is that well, about? each state um, in the Union has a waiver they call it different names 
but once a child reaches uh, post entitlement age, which is usually 21, um, they're, um, they can get a waiver based on need, um, and that covers the costs of, of their day programming so that the parents can work and, and they're cared for. A respite if they need uh, overnight um, habilitation, like we do, just um, you know, a person coming in and, and hanging out with the, the, the adult child, taking them to the YMCA or to the library or out to other recreational activities, as well as the residential piece. Um, so state by state it varies and um, it's getting harder and harder mm -hmm. to obtain the waivers because of the budget constrictions at the state level. It's 60% federal money, 40% state. And you only get it if you live in the state. So I couldn't take my son's waiver and come and move to Alabama. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, uh -huh. there's not a, a lot of self-determination. But um, you know, I can't I implore you enough to advocate for the waiver, for whatever your state calls it, at a young age, like maybe at 16, get the wheels going, get your um, an, um, an assessment, and um, get your child in the in the system. Mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, because it's it's necessary, right. you know. It's, because before 20, before 16, hopefully, if some, mm -hmm. <clears throat> maybe they're in schools, yes, right? So you're doing the school, stream. right? Yeah. So it's a whole the yes. different funding issue. Yeah, but right? unfortunately, in this country, once they hit 21, mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot of options. Right. And unfortunately, the professionals, like the OTs, the speech therapists, the PTs, they give up. Mm -hmm. You know, you give up on a 25-year-old. You mm -hmm. feel, oh, well, they're at their limit. They can't grow anymore. They can't learn anymore. That's not yeah. true. Mm -hmm. Joe, let's take an email. Okay, it says, my son is autistic and 26 years old. I know he needs to leave home, but I'm not ready for him to do this. What should I do? And this is Teresa from Georgia. Uh, start visiting different um, communities. There are some wonderful homes, truly, um, that are secular. and Or there's, um, they're out of the box. You know, they are holistic, faith-based. Um, they do organic farming. I mean, there are those kind of places around. You just have to be diligent and, and, and research and, and do your homework. And, um, you know, um, there are good places. Yeah. How hard is it, like you shared about when the priest said to you, he's really angry because he doesn't want to be with you anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, real, how hard is that for mothers and fathers you know, when their children are that age, when they really think they are the sole provider. Um, it hurts your pride. That's, yeah. Is it, is it your pride? Is it control? Is it protection? It's all of the above. Um, mothers, I, I almost want to do a study on mothers of sons, especially mm -hmm. with autism. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, they become their sole purpose of living. And um, even we've seen it with some of our residents. When the resident's doing really well, all of a sudden the mother's calling to complain mm -hmm. or is becoming very passive aggressive. And you wonder, what, what's that about? Mm -hmm. And there's, so there's, they need to be ministered to. Mm -hmm. You know, they need support um, very much. Right, they need so retreats, hard. they need refreshment. Yes. Yeah. yeah, especially autism. Mm -hmm. That's a very challenging disorder. Yes. Let's pause right there. We're gonna hold Ann over from Emmaus Home. We'll be right back, plenty more to come. Please don't go away. an important part of our EWTN family and we would love for you to join us live right here on at home and you can be a member of our studio audience today we have people from all over the place Guatemala Switzerland New Orleans Georgia yeah so we want you to come and be a part all you need to do is contact the EWTN pilgrimage department send them an email pilgrimages at EWTN.com Area code 205-271-2966, and they will make all of those arrangements happening for you. Well, speaking of pilgrimages, EWTN is filming an exciting new documentary featuring Father Nathan Cromley and a group of young Catholics as they journey along the Camino de Santiago in Spain, 
also known as the Way of St. James. And they will be posting their progress on cool. EWTN's Facebook page. So, to give us an update of their progress, here is Father Colm Flynn with Father Nathan in Portugal. You're very welcome to beautiful, sunny Portugal as we get ready to embark on a very special pilgrimage. We'll be walking in the footsteps of St. James, walking the Camino. My first time, and Father Nathan Cromley, your first time too. It is. It's a real joy to be here, I tell you. You're from the Eagle Eye Ministries, and why is it important? Why are we here walking the Camino? I think that when we reach out to young people, we oftentimes sell them short because we act like we have to invent new things all the time or else they won't pay attention. It's just the contrary. Young people want depth. And the Camino is this place of such spiritual intensity that even non-believers flock to it because they sense something here. I want to take the young people of today and put them in contact with that historical context and the tradition that's on fire so that they rediscover their roots. And when they rediscover their roots, they'll give the life of Christ to the world today. Because you're right, in recent years, the popularity of the Camino has really exploded, but the meaning behind it has kind of become a bit blurred, hasn't it? There'll be one way to clear that up, and that's to walk for about 100 <laughs> miles. <laughs> it won't be blurry for long. <laughs> and are you looking forward to the challenge? Are you nervous about it? Because it won't be easy, especially in the heat. Well, you know what they say, it takes a man to be a priest. So you, I, I am, I'm up for the challenge. We wear black habits for a purpose, and that's because we've laid our life down on the altar. So I, I think it's actually an honor to be in the footsteps of James as he went to the end of the earth to do that for our young people today and to encourage them to go back and do that in their church today. We're going to bring life back into places where maybe we've lost some of that fervor. Now, EWTN are lucky enough to be documenting it for an upcoming program in the next few months. Uh, tell me about the group that you have with you. These young people have come here because they are thirsty for God. And what we want to do is meet that thirst, show them the church that wants to preach, that wants to convert their hearts. So this particular group is a com combination of young professionals, and then we have some families with us as well. So it's a wonderful cross-generational experience that I think is going to really provide leaders for the new evangelization. That's what Eagle Eye Ministries is all about. And let's walk over here, Father Nathan, because uh, I think they're thirsty already just for water <laughs> yeah. because we've been walking a bit today getting ready. I'm just going to say hello to them and find out where they're from. What is your name? And where are you from? I'm Brittany Morales. I'm from Chicago, Illinois. Hey, Brittany, and you? And I'm Cassidy LeClaire from Iowa City, Iowa. So, Brittany, you know, why take time out of, I'm sure you have a very busy schedule, mm. to come and do the Camino? A passion of mine at this point is to show the youth, show my generation how practical and logical our faith is. I actually just discerned coming on this Camino um, about a month ago at the Community of St. John in Illinois. Um, so I'm a latecomer to this trip and I'm taking some personal intentions with me. And they're packed and ready to go already. Well, you can track our progress and how we're getting on. You can look at some behind the scenes video clips and we'll have more updates for you on the EWTN Facebook page. Thank you so much. We all look forward to following along on this journey. And so share with us in the few minutes we have left now your hopes for Emmaus Home, how people can help support this great work in any way. Well, um, my hope and prayer is that we'll continue to be sent uh, people to serve um, people with disabilities. I would love to have a girl's house because uh, I know there's girls out there mm -hmm. um, um, that need, need a a place to live, a home. But they would have to come from your geograph geographic Correct. area? Correct. Um, they would have to have... Um, from the state? Yeah. Of from Alabama. Pennsylvania. From Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. Yeah. We're in Pennsylvania, right outside of Philadelphia. Yeah. Um, and, and also that God continues to bless us with um, people with servants' hearts that want to live in community for a minimum of a year or longer, or mm -hmm. couples, or, you know, college grads, or, um, you know, post-retirement, mm -hmm. whatever, we're open. Uh, but we're just in great near, need of uh, volunteers. Um, you know, we are new and we're a startup, we're in our infancy, so our needs are very great. Um, there's a lot of challenges we face. Um, so we have a website, so you can contact me through the website, through email. We have a donation button, you know, we are a, a 501c3. Um, and I just ask you for your prayers. And I thank you for this wonderful opportunity um, for me to speak about the blessing of Emmaus Home. Mm -hmm. It is. Well, thank you so much. Um, what an unlikely candidate with eight children, <laughs> a child with special 
needs and and what you've done is you just placed yourself out there and you've said Lord I want every child especially those with special disabilities to be loved like my child's being loved and that they might come into their full potential be loved yeah. uh, be a part of a community part of society come into the fullness of all that they could possibly be yeah. and and you placed yourself out there so I hope that many many people will respond and get on board for this blessing. So thank you so very much thank for you, being Rob. with thank us. You thank you for your for beautiful mother's heart. Thank you Bless for you. this opportunity. Well, we thank you for being with us today on At Home with Jim and Joy. We thank God for the EWTN network that stands so solidly for the sanctity and dignity of every human being, especially the least, that God is mysteriously with them and in them. And all that we've heard about uh, people with disabilities, intellectual disabilities, you know, they're not disabled spiritually. And many of them, as we heard today, are way out in front of us. They're advanced of us in so many uh, ways. And every face is the face of God. It may be veiled, it may be in a riddle, but that face of Christ is there. So let us serve everyone, especially those with special disabilities. Not pity, serve them and let them serve you. You might be surprised how close Christ is to you in them. God bless you. God bless all of your loved ones. Keep it on EWTN. Bye now.